in the tab just down on the screen, which uh, says Q and A, and that you are able to actually put your question there. And uh, we can also be able to share and to actually vote for the question that we feel are much more uh, pressing for each one of us. So if you go to the question and you just vote for it, then you'll be able to answer it. And then second of all is that we are not able to also have uh, everyone's mic uh, not muted. So you realize that you have muted all your mics and that's because uh, of avoiding echoes and avoiding disturbances in terms of uh, our communications. So uh, in terms of sharing of the questions, please put your question in the Q&A and, &A and uh, Linda will be able to uh, work on that and we, Linda will be supporting us in terms of looking at the Q&A tab. And secondly, also if you have any challenges, uh, feel free to also uh, put your comments on the chat section where Matthew will be looking at it uh, on and off and we'll be able to address it as we move on during the webinar. So today we are joined by a number of uh, interesting people who will be also introducing themselves as we go on in the webinar. So for now, I'd like to uh, take this webinar to, uh, to start off. And to start off, we are going to have uh, Catherine Mongai from CCAFS, who will be able to share what did you really get from the online discussion be able to highlight some of the key interesting aspects that we got from the online discussions from different people across the continent. But also we'll be able to highlight how do we see this rolling out. So thank you so much and uh, welcome, Catherine. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you very much, Alpha. Um, as I wait, okay, yes, so the slides are, are now up. Um, as Alpha said, my name is Catherine Ngai, and I, I work with CCAFS. That's a CGI research program on climate smart, um, on climate change, agriculture, and food security. And uh, we are I'm based in Nairobi. And I'll be sharing insights or highlights that uh, came on through the online discussion that we kick started on 20th June. And I'd like to point out that the platform is still open. So even as we continue with the discussion, if you feel that you would like to contribute or um, you have some insights that you'd like to share with us, kindly just log into the online discussion and uh, share your thoughts, experiences, or any innovative ideas that uh, you may have come across or that you're implementing as a young farmer. Um, so um, basically, the online discussion and the webinar were answering some of the following questions. For example, as a young person engaged in agribusiness, how is COVID-19 and other climate-related shocks such as the floods and the deserts, uh, locusts affecting your personal and professional life? Uh, how are you organizing your work and resources to cope with the crisis from an economic and health perspective, uh, recognizing that COVID-19 is something that's actually affecting our health directly? How, have your, how has your government and other organizations supported you to cope with these challenges? What lessons have you learned? What innovative ideas have you applied or observed? And what kind of support would you need to face this pandemic and other climate-related challenges? Um, so in the next slides, I'll now be talking about some of the issues that were raised by the commenters online. And our first, um, um, so Matthew, next slide, please. Um, our first comment came from Nur, Nur Mohammed uh, from Somali, actually. And, um, and they say that as the youth of Somali, the COVID-19 has, has led to young people being unemployed. They've stopped uh, the ongoing uh, between community. There's no information sharing and people are, are unaware about the uh, pandemic. Um, and then there's also the issue of floods and people have been uh, displaced because of, of the floods from their homes and um, especially the areas that are um, irrigated. Um, and then the next uh, challenge came in from Lawrence Tanui, who was speaking about the desert locusts in East Africa. And he says that they're causing a major crisis, not only for food, but also for humans and also focusing on the livestock and other and also the birds. And he was pointing out that the challenge is how to control the outbreak. And he suggested that perhaps we need to have desert locust scouts to survey and report the outbreaks of the locust for the best control methods. And then our next challenge came in from Irene. 
Irene uh, works also with pastoralists, and she says that experiences from the youth we work with have been immense, with some of the young people being retrenched. Some have lost their sources of income. This is affecting their purchasing power for farm inputs, such as fertilizer and certified seeds. Um, the pandemic has also affected the livestock farming among the pastoralists, with many registering negative effects because of closure of livestock markets and the shutdown of hotels. As you know, we've, we've been having this lockdown and people have been encouraged to stay home. And of course, this has affected industries such as the hotel industry. Um, then our next challenge, um, okay, we are done with the challenges. So now we look at some of the coping strategies that were proposed online. Um, so Blaze says that it's difficult, but we have not lost hope. With the lockdown and the curfew that has been imposed in our areas, majority of youths are idle and depend on casual labor in farms for, for a day's meal. But she continues to say that as a mentor and as a strategist, I have talked to around 20 youths in my neighborhood on how they can use the already available resources and space to do something productive. And they have prepared a seedbed for kale and spinach, which they will be transpla transplanting and able to sell to their neighborhoods and also to, to start saving for larger projects. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> Sorry. And then Stella Naguja from Uganda, she says that there have been some interesting innovations that were already with us, but now they seem more pronounced. There's a youth in the suburb where I stay who told me his story of how once he lost his job, he's used an old bicycle which he loads with fruits and vegetables, and he goes around with a, uh, with a loudspeaker to call out to whoever needs the items. That, um, that he's selling as he rides through the neighborhood. So you can see young people are really trying to cope with this um, tragedy. I <coughs> um, hope that's not uh, our current pandemic. Uh, moving on, so the social media play a pivotal part in our businesses in these times, and it's highly, it's highly advisable for the youth and small agribusinesses to tap into it and showcase to the world what we are able and capable to do in working to mitigate resilience in sustainable agribusiness and achieving the zero hunger and poverty. So this is a comment that came in from Paul Atsu, who is calling on the use of social media. Um, you know, like even, I don't know if you can call Zoom social media, but you can see that we have really shifted a lot to the virtual platforms in order to cope with the pandemic. So these are some of the things that we need to capitalize on even as we move forward. Um, next slide, please. Um, so yes, uh, the lack of local, this is from Stella Durang who says that the lack of local practical agricultural training centers is a challenge. And post COVID-19, I would want to see more youths organizing to form hubs and centers of excellence. And I think this is very inspiring. Such centers can offer demo farms information centers on finance, insurance, new hybrids of seeds. They can operate on membership fees and commissions. And this is an, a business opportunity that can be easily financed and scaled. So this discussion platform can therefore bring together stakeholders with the capacity to host agri-tech hackathons that result in actionable models and incubation of such ideas. So I hope as we move forward, we are going to be able to come up with a way forward that is going to enable us to see how we can engage youth to become more resilient to climate risks and even uh, other pandemics. Um, next slide, please. And um, finally, we have this tweet that I found very interesting from one of our partners who said that in the COVID-19 pandemic, young agripreneurs continue to epitomize this. And we have CSAYN's Anthony Malobi, who could not import a solar dryer, so he made one from locally assembled material. And I'm very excited to point out that Anthony is one of, he's on the panel, I'm preempting, but he's on the panel, and I hope he's going to be sharing more about this innovative idea and how he came to think about it and how it's, it's also helping him uh, cope with the pandemic. And um, as I finalize um, on the next slide, I'll just point out some of the suggestions and ideas and areas of support that are emerging from the online discussion. 
For example, there's the, youth, there's the need to develop youth-focused business models. Um, the young people need seed funds to help them set up their agribusinesses and also to enable them to become more sustainable and efficient. They need access to land. Um, the, uh, there was a suggestion also for developing financial and financial tools that cater for the needs of young people. This could be insurance, ICT tools, weather forecast, and, you know, uh, and many others. And there's also the issue of capacity building because you find that young people uh, require the technical skills that will enable them to establish and also to, to run business enterprises. So they have all these ideas and they, they could be able to implement them, but they need the technical skills to enable them to do that. Um, so next slide. Um, so just to point out that the discussion forum is still open. And in case you feel inspired during our webinar uh, to share your inputs, kindly log in and let us know what your thoughts are. So on behalf of all the partners, I want to thank all the online contributors for their insights, for sharing their challenges with us and also for their, for their innovations. And hopefully as we continue with the discussion and even as we continue to cope with the pandemic, the panelists and other people who are joining us on the discussion, we can brainstorm on ideas how we can enable, to, we can enable the young people to become more resilient. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Catherine, for those uh, very well put together thoughts and, and, and a few things that come up into my mind already is uh, we're in a situation whereby young people are facing tripartite kind of uh, a pandemic. We have desert locust in the East African region, we have floods going on, then we have the pandemic itself. And, and indeed, this is a very hard date kind of a situation for young people who, even before this, were already very uh, much at risk. So the key things that come up from that are very interesting and, and, and how we put up uh, some of these uh, mechanisms and structures to be able to support young people on those very good uh, articulated way forwards will be very interesting. So as we move on forward to the next session where we'll listen from young people who we've been able to support even from different programs, from True Scale, from Siani, from SICAFs, and from all the other partners that we've been able to work with and support them. It will be interesting to also hear from the participants on the Q&A uh, section and please kindly just uh, direct your question. If you have a specific question directed to the person, just write directed to this and this person. But also just share your inputs in terms of what are some of the thoughts that come to your mind when you think about issues of how to support young people. We are, of course, not experts. We do not have all the answers. And that's why we have everyone uh, uh, today. So feel free to share that. And I would like to move on to, uh, uh, to our next session where we'll have different young entrepreneurs uh, speaking to us. And to start us off would be uh, Ngayo Nevis, who is working with Practical Action in Western Kenya region and working in the poultry value chains. And will be sharing with us how this has been unfolding from uh, his, his own experience and his own business. So uh, very much welcome, uh, Nevis. Well, uh, I'm glad to join everyone on this platform. My name is uh, Ngayo Nevis. Uh, I own a company known as uh, Mayombe Hatchery. I provide uh, egg hatching services to small uh, scale farmers with no incubators of their own. I also trade in chicks and uh, I provide technical support or advisory services to poultry farmers across Western Kenya where we work closely with the practical action. Basically what I can say is that uh, with this uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, tragedy, it has come with its own fortunes, such as uh, all of a sudden we see that even as more youth tend to have more time on their hands, it has uh, made some of them think of uh, venturing into poultry farming. And we've seen a surge in demand for chicks, but uh, at the same time, due to the restriction in movement by government, our supply chains have been disrupted. We are not able to get goods uh, from other parts of the country. We are not able to get uh, chicks from other parts of the country. Uh, another thing I can say is also that uh, the way we interact with farmers has also been limited. Uh, now you notice that uh, we, are being we are being asked to keep a social distance. So, 
I no longer go to farms to meet my clients, but I try to do most of the, the consultation on phone. So we also seen that the, the floods that came affected a lot of our farmers who live along the shores of Lake Victoria. Also as nearby rivers burst where uh, the uh, kind of burst uh, or rather nearby rivers caused the flooding around the lake and also the lake had uh, some backflow. So a lot of young people lost their poultry to the floods and that has really affected them and uh, pushing them into the poverty. Otherwise, uh, it's quite a challenge and it's, it's uh, making us to be more innovative the way we do things in the new normal. Thank you. Uh, Nevis, thanks so much for that. Uh, maybe a few questions to interact a bit more with you. Uh, so number one, you, from what I understood from you, is that there has been an increase in the demand for the uh, chicks, yeah? Very right. much, yes. Okay. And, and has that uh, led you to increasing your capacity or what have you been able to do in terms of meeting that demand? What, has, what have you been doing differently to meet that demand? Well, the demand has surged, but the supply is low and uh, the prices are also high, the margins have shrunk. So it's, it's really tough. Uh, uh, I'm trying to expand my capacity, but uh, it's not really meeting the demand, uh, but it has also made me now think outside the box, reach out to more partners, more people to work closely with. I'm going online, trying to know who else may be having what I need. Uh, occasionally, we've been forced to even source chicks from across the borders, but now there is restriction in terms of uh, uh, that movement basically is a mixture of fortunes i can say i can't say it's, it's a good thing i can say it's a bad thing but really that's the experience my own personal experience now okay. i also have hello hello you can go on I'm going. yes now i also have now to to get my the people i work with used to perhaps using social media or uh, to communicate so that they don't really expect me to be to be with them physically you can also notice now we are limited hello nevis can't do the trainings we used to do closely with the people back and hello nevis we are losing you a bit Hello. Hello. Yeah, uh, we had lost you a bit. Oh, you lost me a bit. I think someone is interfering with my call. Okay. My it's back. Okay, just, just go. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so basically, we are no longer able to conduct trainings, physical trainings, and you know, not everybody is able to use such platforms as Zoom. But going forward, I think. We may start having Zoom calls, Zoom meetings with uh, our clients or our young people if they are capacity built to be able to do that. Okay. Thank you so much, Nevis. I know one of the panelists also, uh, whom we support from TrueSkill, will be able to share a few ideas uh, with you as well and with everyone as well on how you can be able to do training for farmers online and <laughs> how you can yes, yes. uh, kind of work around the, the situation. So, uh, but thanks so much for those, uh, uh, for those inputs. So maybe one last quick question. Uh, have you been able to receive any support in terms of maybe from practical action from other organizations in terms of uh, supporting you during this period? Very much. I think uh, we are doing a lot of practical action. Even right now we are working on a collaboration note uh, they are trying to see how they can help me increase my capacity. They can try help me lower my cost of production that I yeah. can pass on to more youth and encourage more youth to engage in activities that can be a source of income to them. So practical action really has been a great pillar in my work and I'm really working very closely with them. You know, Thank you so much. 
especially Kisumu County. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks so much, Nevis. Uh, yeah, I think some of the key things that we need to look at is how to uh, to share this knowledge across young people within agribusiness as well. Because I believe there's a lot that uh, peer learning that can happen uh, between even young entrepreneurs, but even beyond that. But also it's trying to look at how can we scale up some of these interesting innovations that are being done by some of the partners, for example, uh, from two scale, from CCAVs, from practical action. How can we be able to support some uh, scaling of some of these innovations to support many more young people and to support even the cross learning and the engagement that we have. So thanks so much, Nevis. Uh, once again, everyone, uh, feel free to put in your questions and answers or comments or inputs on the Q&A tab, uh, but also on the chat section, you can be able to interact more and we'll be able to pick some of these questions as we move forward. Linda, do we have anything uh, interesting for uh, on the Q&A tab that is uh, coming up? Maybe a minute before we go to the next. Uh, um, next yes, we can take one question here from Selina Butali. Uh, yeah. What are the main limitations to advancing the poultry farming business, given that the market seems available? Thank you so much, Linda. So maybe a minute, uh, Nevis, just a minute before we move on to Rakan and you can respond to maybe one of these questions that came up strongly on the poultry value chain. Well, I can say one of the major limitations is that uh, <coughs> many youth lack the knowledge, you know? Many people want to keep chicken, but they really don't have the knowledge about how to keep chicken. And uh, keeping poultry is uh, knowledge intensive. You can have everything, but if you don't have the knowledge and skills, the project will fail. So capacity, building capacity in terms of training is really critical. And that's what we've been doing with practical action. We brought together youth. We have tried to do some training, not only in areas of production, but uh, even marketing, market interest groups, uh, to encourage youth and also to teach them how to run poultry as an enterprise, poultry farming as an enterprise. Does that answer the question or I need to add more? Thanks so much, Nevis. That's okay. Uh, we can pick more uh, later on. And thanks so much, Linda, for bringing that up. So without uh, wasting too much time, I think I'm going to go to pick up the next a speaker who is uh, Ruha Kana, uh, who is the CEO uh, of uh, Agro-Tourism Organization of Uganda, working closely with Agpo Focus. Uh, welcome so much, uh, Ruha Kana. Hey, Ruha Kana, we can't hear you. Hello. Hi, hi. We can hear you now. Yes, perfect. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you're watching us from. Luhakana Joseph Talemwa is my name. I am an African based in Uganda. I work for a company called Agrotourism Association. Agrotourism Association, we mainly promote agribusiness enterprises as tourism attraction centers. So one actually would say we are in the business of tourism. Uh, yes, COVID, everybody has talked about COVID-19 in a very negative perspective. But I would say, yes, it has also come up with quite a number of opportunities across the globe. And uh, from my personal experience, uh, in Uganda especially, everybody has come up to appreciate that agriculture or agribusiness is a very important sector globally. I think to me that's a lesson that I've learned, that everybody globally now is able to appreciate that agriculture is the biggest and the most important sector. Uh, because uh, yes, initially we could talk about uh, supporting agribusiness, supporting it, but not really very many people actually see much value. But because uh, many people are locked down now, because many people now cannot go for entertainment, they are only left with an option of actually eating. So that's, that to me, it is very, very important that after COVID, 
many people who actually had not thought that this is a very big sector, they should be able to listen to us. Yes, uh, but also uh, another key important uh, lesson that I have learned, uh, the people have come to appreciate the role of ICT, especially Hello, Ruhakana. Hello. We lost you. Okay. Uh, I think maybe we should go on to the next panelist as we wait for Ruhakana to come back and we're going to uh, probably just take him back when he's back. So maybe Matthew can help me to put on Ian. Uh, Ian from uh, uh, Home Range Poultry, who is the CEO of Home Range Poultry, and working with uh, Two Scale and has been supported with Two Scale. Uh, so maybe uh, yes, Ian. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Ian. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's uh, uh, tuned in. It's a pleasure to be on this uh, webinar. And uh, uh, for purposes of uh, this uh, webinar, uh, my name is uh, Ian Mutwiri. I am the CEO for Home Range Poultry. Now, Home Range Poultry is a company that uh, specializes in the sale and distribution of the uh, improved Kienyeji chicken. And uh, just like uh, my own Behacharis has uh, actually outlined, uh, there is, you know, I'm in the poultry value chain. And uh, our main business is to deal with the local indigenous Kenyaji chicken. Uh, perhaps the main difference between uh, Home Range and uh, Mayombe <coughs> uh, is the fact that uh, Home Range is along the entire value chain, uh, starting from uh, hatching, starting uh, going on to poultry feeds, going on to the trainings that uh, Ruakana had actually pointed out that uh, you know you can't do this thing without uh, the knowledge. Eh? And uh, of course, we also do have an outgrowers program. Uh, where we are able to assist the farmers, connect them with, uh, uh, with the market. Uh, we also do quite a lot in the consumption section because uh, most of the chicken that we actually buy from the poultry farmers is actually slaughtered and taken for consumption to the BOP consumers and also to just uh, ordinary Kenyans. So one of the key things that uh, Home Range really does focus on eh, is uh, looking at these challenges which you are discussing and coming up with solutions. Now, Home Range Poultry has basically grown purely because we really like to focus on the problems that uh, we note in the value chain and we try to address that problem. Now, currently, Home Range is uh, working with Two Scale on uh, quite a, a wholesome uh, project that uh, is going to be focusing on the smallholder farmers and, and helping the smallholder farmers deal with some of the challenges that they actually face which of course include the uh, access to quality chicks. So as I mentioned, Home Range Poultry is a hatchery. I'm sure at the very back, you can see some of our posters for the chicks. Uh, so our chicks are sold directly to the farmers, direct farmer to farmer, or through various other uh, partnerships. And uh, on this note, I would actually look forward to working with the uh, Mayombe uh, hatcheries. Uh, I think there's a partnership that is doing uh, right there. So having said that, uh, I would want, uh, perhaps if it's possible, Alpha to share the, the business model that we use for you to understand when we'll be discussing about the challenges that, uh, yes. So here's an outline of basically the home range poultry business model, which I would like to take a minute to explain. Now, if you check at the center, there's home range uh, poultry, which is ourselves. And uh, down to the smallholder farmers, eh, we do supply the chicks, the feeds. The training is a very critical element and also veterinary support. Now, you may train a farmer, eh, to really be able to uh, you know, identify a disease, but they still need further support by a veterinary uh, officer. And uh, in Kenya, veterinary support is not really widespread at the grassroots. So connecting the farmer with veterinary support is uh, with the veterinary support is very, very critical. And uh, once a smallholder farmer produces his chicken, as you can see, uh, we buy back the live chicken, which now we process and slaughter. And once we slaughter it, it is uh, delivered as a dressed or packaged chicken directly to the consumer. Now, in our business model, we also appreciate that the farmer can also make direct sales to the consumer. So as you can see, uh, there's also farmer to consumer sales, which we really strongly encourage. And you find that actually 60 to 70% uh, 
of the chicken that is actually produced by the smallholder farmers is actually distributed to the consumer uh, through direct sales, either at their farm gates or during the market days. Alpha. So being a youth who's uh, actually been a great business, COVID has been uh, quite a major challenge. And uh, there are a couple of things that is actually affected. And one of them is actually, you notice that there's actually an interruption uh, in the input supply chain. So for us, we are a company that largely depends on the farmers actually coming to us to get the chicks and the feeds. But now since the April 7th, when the government actually <coughs> announced a cessation of movement in Nairobi and we're within the Nairobi metropolitan, the farmers could actually not be able to come in. So that became a major, one of the major uh, effects of COVID on us. Uh, there's also another major issue, which is the loss of business for vets and uh, trainers who work within our network. Now, within a particular area, let's say far reaching areas, eh, we work with partners, you know, agro vet shops that, you know, we are able to refer farmers within that locality to them to give them uh, support. And of course, unfortunately, these people have actually lost a lot of business since uh, a lot of farmers are not able to access these uh, chicks and feeds. There's also the other challenge that is uh, uh, the infiltration of poor quality feeds. This is becoming a, a, a major issue because whenever a gap arises, sometimes you find that they are still trust business people who infiltrate to come in and bring uh, farmers very poor quality feeds. And uh, of course, this has become a major, uh, has had major effects uh, to poultry farmers because this is, has actually killed their production. You find that there's very poor production. Even for the farmers who had gotten chicks from us much earlier, and uh, because of this COVID issue, they are not able to continue getting access to our high quality feed. You find that all of them are complaining of uh, poor production and this is causing them some massive financial losses. Of course, there's definitely from all this, the drop in um, uh, farm output. So you find that once the farmers are not able to access chicks or access feeds and all these other inputs, unfortunately, their production uh, drops drastically. So that is on the end to do with the farmer. Uh, as a company also home range, there's been quite a number of uh, uh, effects of COVID and climate change. And one of the major effects is of course the drop in income, considering that you know we are not moving out as many chicks uh, and feeds as uh, we usually used to. Now, as uh, my own Bihachari has actually pointed out, it is very true, especially in the last two months, uh, orders for chicks have actually skyrocketed. I can confirm that uh, for us, we've actually experienced almost between 200 and 300% increase in our orders for chicks. So that's good for business. However, you know, because of the, again, drop in uh, poultry output, eh? so, you know, like he mentioned, we are not able to meet the demand. Uh, our supply is not able to meet the demand that is there. So that's a major challenge. Of course, we've had to take austerity HR measures, uh, you know, just like any other company. There's also, you know, challenges such as uh, cutting down on uh, production. And I know one of the uh, attendants had actually asked if there's demand, why are you not increasing uh, uh, production? And uh, I'll tell you for free that uh, increase in production eh, has always, has always, uh, is always connected to the aspect to do with the poultry farm output because you know it's the eggs that we incubate. So if the eggs are actually becoming less, so it becomes a problem for you to meet that demand. So as much as this business, unfortunately, because of the low output of the eggs, we ourselves we have to reduce the output for chicks as well. Um, so there's there's that effect. The other thing that you notice uh, at the farm level, the smallholder farm level, is that there's actually a drop in a uh, farm output. I already mentioned that because there's a supply interactions. And with this, I'm uh, relating this to where the farmer is actually selling his chicken to home range. You realize that because of the lockdown, unfortunately, they're not able to bring the chicken to us. So of course, there's a supply interruption. And of course, that of course uh, causes them a drop in uh, their income. Eh? There are farmers out there who are wholly depending on home range poultry to, provide, to buy their chicken back. And uh, unfortunately, because they're not able to bring the chicken to us, it becomes a problem for them, especially those ones who are in uh, far flung areas. There's also the issue that I mentioned about the drop in quality, because uh, for home range, for us, it's, it's very, very important. There are quality aspects that the farmer has to meet. So when they're not getting quality feeds, of course, the, the quality output is low, and we unfortunately are not able to absorb that product. Uh, then on the processing side, uh, where we process or slaughter the chicken for consumption market, you realize that there's actually a reduction uh, of the personnel who are in that line, purely because their output has also gone down. And of course, to the consumer, you and I as a consumer, if I was to speak, we are also affected because there's a drop in supply. And this drop in supply, like currently in Nairobi, has seen the skyrocketing of a uh, uh, chicken, especially the local Kennedy chicken, which is what we specialize in. 
And of course, whenever these uh, uh, you know, uh, supply goes down, you find that nutritional issues also arise because people are no longer able to access a, a quality uh, of nutritious uh, products. So apart from that, you find that we have had to come up with coping mechanisms. Uh, and uh, this is where perhaps uh, uh, people like my own that could actually pick up and look on how have we managed to turn around the business and continue to stay in business. Uh, one, I'll tell you for free that being in business for nine, 10 years does help because it gives you a lot of business experience. So to the youth who are out there who are actually venturing into a good business, I strongly encourage you not to give up just because you know, you're know you experiencing a few challenges. All of us have experienced those challenges, but look at it, nine, 10 years down the line, you're still in business and it's actually paying off. So what are some of the strategies that we've actually employed, some of the coping strategies since COVID was announced? So one of the key things, like I mentioned, is that there was a lockdown. Uh, of Nairobi metropolitan area and farmers are not able to come in uh, to get our chicks or feeds and we're also not able to go out. However, uh, the government did mention that uh, they're allowing uh, movement of cargo and farm produce. So we use that loophole to contract transporters who, you know, open people who are offering transport. Now these people are the ones that we link the farmer with and the farmer can use those people to get products from us and that transporter goes and delivers to the farmer. So, of course, there has been an effect that, uh, you know, this is going to cause a, a rise in the cost for the farmer, eh? but it's a minimal cost considering that um, uh, you can't be able to get the chicks directly yourself. So, you find that we've also developed, like uh, Alfred said, uh, an online uh, poultry training module. Now, what is very interesting about this is that uh, the online, the poultry farming uh, module took as a uh, almost two years to conceptualize it, but it only took us two weeks the moment COVID hit for us to implement it. Eh? And you are online and uh, we actually host it on the Facebook groups. So what basically happens is that uh, we've created content that is almost about 12 hours. And uh, this content is pretty comprehensive and actually also includes uh, uh, a tour of our poultry farm so that you know once you get your training, you're also able to see how the farm looks and how we operate. And uh, this online training has been uh, has been quite an eye opener, and I would strongly encourage anyone in agribusiness to actually uh, consider deploying that. And you don't have to look for an expensive option. You can always use platforms, uh, social media platforms such as uh, Facebook groups and uh, Instagram and all that. And you get paid, and uh, you know you get people access. And our trainings have actually continued uh, seamlessly even after COVID, uh, despite the fact that people are not able to move in. And actually, these are the, like a uh, Ian. Yes, please. I'm very Four sorry minutes. to uh, to interrupt you, but could you have your mic a bit closer to your mouth because okay. we're okay. having sorry. some and difficulties with the sound? Is it better now? I hope so. I hope so. Yes, and could you please also uh, take maybe two more minutes to to wrap up? Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks. So, thanks. apart from the issue to do with the utilizing social media platform we've actually also started using technology to monitor our farms. You realize like uh, Mayombe noted that sometimes you're not able to go to the farmers. Actually, it's the same case with me. I'm not able to go to the farmers often I used to, to go manage the place. So what I've done is I've actually have, uh, installed CCTV surveillance, Wi-Fi CCTV surveillance. As I'm sitting here talking to you on this webinar, I'm throwing my eyes on the left side and checking out uh, the screens for my farm and I'm able to get access to the entire operations at the farm. And whenever I have customers coming in, I'm able to coordinate with the team at the farm to actually continue making sales. From this same place where I'm seated, I'm also able to monitor my ticks, which are the farm, and I'm also able to use various other uh, technology outputs, such as there's something that is called the, the Arenifu Smart Brooder System, that is actually able to help you monitor your ticks remotely to find out whether the temperature in the brooders is, uh, is correct. And this is actually a partner that was we were linked with the, through the two-scale program. Uh, also, on the aspect to do with climate change, we realized that because of our drop in earnings, eh, we had to look for a cheaper solution to provide heat to our chicks. So what we did is that uh, we explored the option of using a uh, biofuel, uh, specifically an ethanol-based uh, biofuel. And uh, what has been amazing is that uh, this biofuel has helped us cut down the cost of uh, electricity to almost a bare minimum. And uh, number one is, of course, uh, it's climate smart solution and that uh, it's really helped us. So finally, uh, we also have booklets, which uh, I would strongly encourage everyone who's in agribusiness to look for all these channels, especially social media, to be able to reach out to their customers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ian. Uh, very key points coming out in terms of innovation, in terms of trying to look at new ways of doing things. And uh, one of the key 
agendas for this webinar as well was to look at how do you bridge the partnership between people like Ian and people like Mayong Hatcheries to be able to also uh, build that cross learning opportunities. And I see this as a very good opportunity to try and look at how can you work together, the both of you. So thanks so much, Ian, for your inputs. Thanks so much for your invaluable uh, contributions. Thank you. So uh, maybe, Linda, is there anything coming up strongly? Uh, the Q&A is very, very active. Uh, it's very fun to see. Uh, but we could take this uh, question that goes both to Ian and Navis. Um, what do you think has caused the increased demand for chicks? Is it that the supply has reduced due to the COVID or suddenly more people are interested in poultry farming? One minute, Ian. Yes, so basically from our perspective, uh, Linda, eh, the main reason why there's been this spike of demand for in chicken is purely because people are losing their jobs, you know, the, the formal kind of office jobs. Eh? And people are looking, what other options can they do? I can tell you for free that in the last two months, eh, uh, even in Kenya, quite a number of people have lost their jobs. So they're looking for other alternative uh, income generating activities. And poultry always looks, uh, and is always the number one option, purely because uh, as much as it is a uh, uh, high capital intensive, uh, you can always start very small and your project could actually grow. Uh, when we started, we only started with about, I uh, started only with about 50 chicks. And I think now we keep, you know, a stock of almost about 2000 chicken. And uh, okay. so this loss of uh, income by a lot of people uh, is actually now sort of becoming a blessing to people who are in their business for people to look okay. for alternative uh, uh, incomes. So, okay, uh, thanks so much, Ian. Uh, Nevis, do you have something to add on top of that? Just a minute, please. Well, okay. uh, let, let, let me just say very quickly that Ian has really put it out very clearly that now okay. as people have more time on their hands, they are looking for something, some alternative economic activities and... Uh, yeah, okay. Thanks so much, Nevis. Uh, thanks so much, Ian, for your... One of them. And he, yes. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks so much, Ian, as well, for your uh, contributions. Now, I would like to move on to the next speaker, uh, which is uh, Anthony Malovi, and then I'll come back to Yuru Hakana immediately after, after Anthony has been done. So, uh, welcome so much, Anthony. Hello? Hi, Anthony. I uh, yes, hope you can hear me. Yes, you can hear you now. Yes, uh, my name is Anthony Malovi. And uh, currently, hello? Yes, go ahead, go ahead, Anthony. You can hear you. Yes, you can hear me well, huh? Yes. Yes, uh, my name is Anthony Malovi, and I'm the Assistant Country Coordinator for CSOI in Kenya. I'm also an entrepreneur. And I also sit on the board of Kenya National Chambers of Commerce and Industry. So for today, I'll just speak about innovation and what as youth we can do in terms of uh, agriculture. So basically when Catherine was speaking, I saw she put up a photo of a solar dryer that I made uh, about uh, two, three weeks ago. Actually it came about because of, um, in Transoya where I am, we have a lot of floods and so many people are suffering. And you see, we are also the food basket of Kenya where so many people are growing a lot of crops. So here we have um, rain, here we have COVID, here we have locusts, although it's not uh, too much. But what can a young person or basically a farmer do when you encounter such situations? So what I can basically speak about, I cannot really speak about COVID or uh, the locusts of flooding. I'll just say that innovation is something that we need to embrace as, um, as farmers and as young people. Because we can talk about this COVID in terms of um, lack of market. When the government closed all the markets, then here you have someone who wanted to buy something, he cannot go to town, he cannot sell his produce, he cannot buy. So what do you do? You see, we have someone like uh, Joseph of Mkulimayang. Actually, Mkulimayang started way back, long time ago but people didn't know about it. And just because we have now COVID, is now when people have realized there's something called Mkulima Yang, where you can post your stuff and you can sell your things. 
Another thing we can say is uh, when you talk about maybe the locust, you need to spray the locust, which is the easiest way. We can use maybe drones to, to, to spray them. But you see all these things, yes, they were there, but we didn't use them. Or maybe someone was just saying, ah, we don't need these things as for now. But I think COVID is a, maybe is a blessing in these guys because now all these innovations that we had, now we can put them into task. So what I can basically say is that I think we need to embrace all the technology that we have in agriculture. We need to use all the minds that we have. And also we need to make sure that all this technology, each and everyone knows about it. Because here I am in Transoia in Kitale, when I tell someone that you can maybe use the Yara app so that you can know whether uh, it will rain tomorrow or when it will rain. But someone will ask me, what is Yara? You see, but as we are on social media, maybe on Twitter, we talk about Yara, we talk about all that, but someone who is in the farm, he doesn't know about that. So we need to create awareness about these things. Any type of innovation that one has, I think it would be better if we have such partners as, maybe you can talk about, um, we have people like SIAT, we have the World Bank and all these organizations. I think we need to create awareness about all these types of innovations that someone might use so that he can go ahead and do his farming well. Another thing maybe I can say about is, uh, mostly we, we have these conferences. Yes, we have them in Nairobi or any country, but I think we need to target those farmers that are outside the town. I think that's, that's the target that we need to go to. Because if we talk about these things only in towns, it will be hard for us. And many people who do farming, actually, okay, nowadays I see even in town, people are doing because of the uh, new types of farming methods like vertical farming and other hydroponics. But you see most of the farmers are far away. So we need to take these ideas to them. We need to show them that actually there are these things that you can use. There is this app where you can maybe post your, 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 your produce and someone will call you. You see, with that, we eliminate also this middleman who come here to, uh, to also try to, to make a living, though, in another bad way. Another thing maybe I can speak about is um, all these organizations that we have. I think we need to nurture the youth more because uh, we, 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 had, we had started a program uh, with CSYN where we used to go to schools, universities. We talk about agriculture, we talk about the new innovations that are there and all the opportunities that one can do. I think this is the way to go because if we want to target the young people about agriculture, then we need to give them information about um, agriculture. So I think I'll, be, I'll just be brief. Uh, the, I saw Catherine say something about the solar dryer. Actually, the solar dryer is a new innovation. Like mine is a hybrid one. Hybrid meaning it can use electricity, it can use the sun, and also it can use biogas. So you see, I was thinking in terms of your farm. What do you have in your farm? Do you have electricity? Do you have, is the sunless, sunlight enough for you? Do you have cow dung? You see, if you have all these things, then it will be easier for you to make a simple dryer that you can use to dry anything. Maybe it's maize, fish, or any other thing. So what I can basically, as I finish, I can say is that we need to embrace technology and we need to create awareness. We can talk about it on Twitter, yes, but how many people in the rural areas have smartphones? See, that's the disconnect. So we need to go to those people and tell them that we have this thing that can work. We can talk about the floods. The floods, maybe it brings about fungus because so many crops, I've seen so many people are suffering because the crops have gone bad. But you see, too much rain also brings fungal diseases. And uh, like I was saying, I made another mobile application, although it's not out in the market. So with this mobile application, it's very simple. I've planted today, let's say, cashew nuts. I've planted today, and I expect maybe in three weeks' time or in four weeks' time, there will be a certain disease that will be there. You see, so this app will alert me after four weeks, I'll go and check my crops and see, okay, I'm expecting this type of disease. Where can I get now then? The maybe can I get an agro, agronomist to come and see it or what can I do? You see, these are the types of things that can make someone at least have fun in farming. Because when you have planted something and then you are waiting for maybe a month, you go to your farm 
and you find like nothing is there. So I think we need, we really need to embrace innovation and we really need to make, create awareness to everybody who is doing agriculture. Okay, uh, thanks so much, Anthony. And thanks so much for the innovation of the solar dryer. I think once again, a very key point coming out is on innovation. And most of the times when we hear that young people are very tech survey, are very uh, well versed with technology and they can, uh, we can harness that energy and that know-how and that knowledge to be able to support the agricultural system. But also on the other hand, most times uh, when we hear that indeed, how do you support young people to get access to some of these innovations? Because really sometimes innovations are very costly as well. But in this perspective, we see a very good example where you can actually use uh, locally available resources to be able to actually get the innovation that you wanted to do. So maybe I will leave it at that point uh, for now. Uh, maybe we can pick questions afterwards. But then I'd like to come back to Ruhakana uh, for some few minutes because we lost you uh, on the way and, and we'd like to give you a few more minutes to be able to finish up your presentation. Then maybe Linda after Ruhakana speaks, then you can come back and get questions before Ruhakana and for Anthony then before we get to the next panelist. Thanks so much. Uh, welcome Ruhakana. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, uh, uh, I was making a point on opportunities uh, for COVID. Now, I, uh, the first point I talked about was, to me, it is very important to appreciate that every part of, uh, of, the, of the group, especially in Uganda, among the people I normally meet, everybody has come to appreciate that agriculture is the biggest and the most important sector. That was done. But secondly, uh, most of the farmers and other stakeholders have also come to appreciate the role of ICT in agriculture and agribusiness development. Uh, because in agro-tourism, we do quite a lot of trainings, hands-on trainings, we go to the field and meet very many farmers. Uh, every, other, every other Friday uh, since the 31st March, that's when the lockdown started in Uganda, we have held Zoom meetings. But it's very, very surprising how actually Lulu based farmers struggle and talk to their uh, talk to their daughters and their sons, trade with them and get them connected to Zoom so that they can benefit from our meetings. So to me, it's important also that everybody has come to appreciate how ICT is important and how it has enabled farmers to grow their businesses. Yes, but also another opportunity uh, that has been brought about by, by COVID is, is the level of innovativeness. Uh, everybody seems not to be thinking. It looks like people used to sleep so much, but everybody now is, is really thinking of how best they can survive, how best they can grow their businesses. And to me, that's very, very important. Uh, uh, because I, I, I think for the last three years, I've been telling people to do home deliveries of agricultural produce. But most of this, I'll talk to the actual not to look or see much sense in uh, uh, business wise uh, for one delivering food. But uh, surprisingly, now everybody is talking about delivering food, delivering food, uh, fresh food, families. And I think to me, that's also important. Uh, even when COVID has brought a number of uh, hindrances and challenges, there are quite a number of opportunities that we now have experienced. Uh, uh, a number of uh, challenges, yes, of course, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, my business basically relies so much on transport because we do we do tourism for those that are not so much conversant uh, uh, it's basically agriculture and tourism that's basically our, our, our business as people are going to look at uh, national parks and mountains and gorillas and lakes me and my team i actually take people to go and see farms to go and see coffee farms to go and visit uh, tea farms to go and visit uh, uh, at the business processing centers, that's this uh, major in my business. And it has been affected because uh, I think since uh, the first March uh, 2020, uh, there hasn't been any, any, any movements. Uh, transport was, was, was put down as a measure to cut down uh, the pandemic. So it has been, it has hit us badly, but, but, but even then, uh, what do we have to do as a go to uh, tourism is not a business that everybody had appreciated initially. But because of the COVID uh, pandemic, it has also given us an opportunity to actually uh, inform many people about the role of, 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 of agro-tourism. I recently we had a meeting with the government of Uganda uh, about how we can reform uh, uh, tourism sector. 
because now uh, uh, whites will not be able to travel from all over the world to come to Uganda to look at the national parks. And one of the things that came out strongly was if agrotourism can be promoted and can be supported, many people would benefit. And the biggest beneficiary would actually be the farmers themselves, because how the farmers, their level of production has possibly gone down, but also the level of income from their farmers has not been the best. But in agrotourism, basically what we do is we, in, we tend to add another form of income to existing agribusiness enterprises. For example, say one who has a coffee farm or one who has a poultry farm like my kind of friend that I've been talking previously. So what we do is we go to this farmer and build his or her capacity so that this farmer is able to actually entertain people to go to the farm. But the same principle uh, of tourism is applicable when people or when visitors go to the farm, they actually pay. They actually pay money as entrance fees because they go and get excited, but also they learn practically. So it's a two-way situation that me or this youth that has a farm benefit because people have come to this farm and have paid. But also even these people that have gone to this farm, they are also able to actually learn agriculture in a practical perspective. Okay. So as a result of, as, as a result of, 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 of COVID, we have been able to reach out to all our members across the country, all of them, and we have been organizing their farms so that uh, immediately after COVID pandemic, all our farmers, all our members, all our youth that we work with are able to do uh, uh, agro-tourism in a better professional manner, also to have it as a sustainable enterprise. Okay. Thank you so yes, much, sir. Rakana. Maybe a quick question. Uh, so yes. by you doing Zoom meetings and Zoom trainings for these uh, farmers, are you still able to reach a significant number as you would have reached uh, when you're doing physical meetings, or is that, is that a bit different? It's, it's a bit different. Of course, we, wouldn't, we are not reaching the number as we would have, but the point okay. I was trying to make is, yes, people have actually appreciated that things can be done using ICT. And yeah. uh, if, yeah. we, if we continue to incorporate ICT and then the physical movement, then I'm sure we're going to reach the number of people that we wouldn't have reached if possibly COVID had not come into play. Okay. Maybe after this, we should do an agro tour to Uganda for chicken. Please, please, please. Uh, by the, for, for, yeah. for, information, for information, every, every, every other year, we organize agro tours across the, uh, across the globe. Uh, this year alone, we had around uh, four, uh, six people that had applied for Kenya International Trade Fair in Nairobi. But because of the, of the pandemic, I'm sure that's not possible. But every other year yeah. we do, we do quite uh, a number of itineraries and we form very many people. And surprisingly, the, the biggest population is always the youth population. Thanks so much for continuously uh, engaging the young people and continuously bridging the gap of knowledge and peer learning and peer influence. And okay. thanks so much for that. And thanks so much also for your invaluable inputs. So without much ado, uh, Linda, is there, are there any pertinent questions coming in for Anthony and for uh, Ruhakana before we go into the next panel. Um, yes, we can take one question first yep. for uh, Ruakana. Uh, you ac acknowledge that agriculture is now appreciated globally. So when it comes to Uganda, do you think the government is prioritizing this sector? And what do you think the government can put more focus on? Yes, uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, e, yes, in Uganda, the government has also appreciated that this, this is the biggest sector. And I think uh, three or four days ago, uh, our Minister for Finance went out the budget. Surprisingly, I think this is the best, the, the, the time when our culture has been allocated a lot of money. Every other year, we always talk about implementing the budget allocation. But it was surprised that I think uh, this is the, the first year, I think in history, that the sector of agriculture has been given a lot of money. I think agriculture and sector. Yes, so it is, uh, it is, it is evident, uh, given, uh, given the budget allocation, that yes, even in Uganda, the government has appreciated the role of agriculture as a result of what's planning. Okay. Thanks so much, Ruhakana. Uh, okay. Maybe Matthew, is there anything that, that's coming up from the chat that's interesting for everyone to know? Uh, the the main uh, comment we have on the chat is uh, for people to 
speak louder. Otherwise, all the questions okay. are in the Q&A. Okay, thanks so much, Matthew. Uh, Linda, one more question or is... Mm. Maybe we can move on and then... We can yes, we can move on and I, I will okay. come back to the questions. Yes, thank you. Thanks so much, Linda. Uh, now I'd like to get to, uh, to hear a bit more from uh, partners or development partners and actors who are working on the youth and supporting young people. And to start us off uh, for a few minutes, I'd like to give it up to Jacob. Uh, Jacob Ochieng, who is from Practical Action Kenya. So please, Jacob, uh, and take us forward. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, and uh, hello to all our viewers around the world. Uh, I'd, I'd like to start off by saying that as Practical Action, we are you know, really proud of the youth who are in agribusiness. Uh, we want to salute your efforts. We want to tell you that you are part of the critical chain for you know, uh, food security uh, around the world. And, and as you realize, you know, as much as COVID has brought, you know, very unprecedented impacts on economy, all governments have actually declared, you know, food and services, essential services. So we are proud of you and as practical action, I want to say that we are putting our best foot forward to ensure that what, whatever it will take for us to ensure that the youth in agribusiness sustain their work is something that is top of our priority. So um, let, me, let me start by putting it this way. We are talking about you know, how to go through COVID uh, at, at the backdrop of climate change. Now, first things first, uh, as and, 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 and concerning the work we do, one thing we have realized is that you know, we will always have to prepare our agribusinesses to face up hazards. That role action has always worked uh, around this, you know, uh, in terms of supporting communities and the youth in agribusiness on early warning systems. And it is important to realize at this point that the impacts of climate change will outlive those of COVID. Uh, floods have been here before COVID, droughts have been here before COVID, locals' invasions have been here before COVID, and we are at a point whereby we are now thinking that as we respond to COVID, the gains that we have made uh, with the youth in terms of climate change adaptation must be safeguarded. If they are not safeguarded, then we are going to lose because climate change is going to outlive COVID. That does not mean that we become complacent and don't really address the issues of resilience for COVID in, in agriculture. One of the things that uh, we want to emphasize is that the practices that the youth and agribusiness have been doing to ensure that the agribusiness are resilient to climate change should be safeguarded. We have been supporting the youth, soil conservation, you know, early warning systems. The technologies that I'm hearing about in this webinar are very fantastic. Those have to continue uh, you know, uh, taking shape. We, uh, we, we, we hear about you know, uh, the skills that the youth have been able to have and improve the agribusinesses agri uh, to be resilient to climate change. Those ones have to be uh, uh, to continue um, being 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 uh, adopted. Uh, the the be also being alert and just uh, ensuring that the disease cycles that are climate related are also you know incorporated in our agribusiness frameworks. I hear you know very nice stories about you know poultry agribusinesses. Those are climate sensitive you know, sectors and uh, all the technologies, the, the knowledge, the early warning systems, monitoring the sea cycles that uh, are impacting uh, those agribusinesses from climate change have to co continue happening. Now, back to the focus of how do we now bring all that and move in a trajectory that now recognizes that COVID is here with us. First thing, we, we, we are supporting the youth to ensure that they are safe in their agribusinesses. And this is something that we recognize because nobody can work when they are sick. Uh, today, uh, we know very well that uh, the mortality out of COVID is affecting demographics at different you know, ranges. Uh, uh, the youth seem to be recording the least, but that does not mean that the concern should be thrown to the wind. We as Spectral Action, are, is, we are supporting, you know, um, 
behavior change communication uh, efforts to ensure that the youth understand that they have to be safe. When we are safe in agribusinesses, we stop spreading the virus. We can be able to work in agribusinesses. We, we, we are healthy. We can connect. We can be able to partner. We can be able to move our businesses around. So number one thing that Patrol Action is doing is that we are at the forefront to ensure that uh, this uh, messaging goes a long way to ensure that our youth who are in agribusiness uh, join hands to help the world stop the spread of the viruses. Uh, the next Maybe thing, Jacob, we... if I may interrupt. Uh, so, for example, if you're saying you're supporting agribusinesses to be able to remain safe, so are you giving, uh, for example, sanitizers and masks, or what? What are you exactly doing? Yes, um, one thing we are uh, supporting with appropriate messaging uh, that uh, okay. we consumed uh, by the youth is important. We can understand what it means to stay safe, and then we are also uh, supporting efforts uh, with the hygiene services. Uh, you know, uh, sanitizers. Uh, there is the, 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 the training on the wearing of the masks and, 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 and we also have, you know, today we are uh, distributing, you know, water storage facilities which are going to benefit, I mean, uh, all vulnerable uh, members of the community, including the youth in agribusiness. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, very critical access to information. Uh, but maybe a few more minutes, Jacob, uh, two more minutes. And you could also yes. share maybe a few more things that you're doing to support these uh, agribusinesses. Thank you. The next, the next, after we have uh, address the issue of stopping the spread. The next important strand in, 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 in this business of complying and, and, and responding to COVID on COVID resilience is to be in a position to keep essential services running in agriculture. So uh, today um, we have supported uh, you know, some county governments in Western Kenya to have platforms that, are, that, they, that can help them to coordinate you know, COVID response, digital platforms. And these digital platforms have you know, a great potential to be able to support, you know, uh, e-extension. They can be able to discuss issues of e-marketing. I have had a panelist here talking about, you know, uh, networking. And networking within a lockdown is, it can be tricky. And, and these digital platforms that we are supporting, uh, the county governments in Western Kenya, will go a, a very long way. And, and I would want to say that e-extension is something that's, that is key here. When people cannot physically meet to transact training, then the option is, 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 is to do it safely. And the, the option of doing it safely must be aided by technology. And the technology here uh, that we, 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 we have seen happening, uh, we have Zoom platforms, we have you know, you know, Facebook networks, uh, we have you know, uh, WhatsApp groups, and, and, and simple you know, mobile application um, uh, platforms. So that will support e-extension, that will support e-marketing. We need to be in a position as part of action, we're supporting the youth to network among themselves to gather market intelligence for their products. This is, now uh, we have interruptions in you know, the, the supply chain. The last thing which we are doing as spectral action is to preposition ourselves to learn from what is happening around climate change and COVID combined response to ensure that this is taken forward to a progressive new learning for agribusiness for the youth so that we don't uh, lose whatever we have learned. Today, as we speak, there are, you know, a lot of learning is taking place. And the, the, the next planning for alternatives uh, is, is something that should be in a position to incorporate. The learning we have had around climate change, the learning we have had, had about uh, around response uh, as a result of COVID. And this combined learning is what practical action is positioning itself so that it can be able to, to take it to the next milestone of programming for multi-hazard resilience uh, for youth in, in, in agribusiness. Otherwise, um, mm. we, we want to, 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 to say that uh, we, we will keep you know, applying ourselves to understand the inhibitors, the opportunities, and the challenges that uh, should be able to take you know, uh, uh, youth agribusiness to the next milestone. Uh, we ask our viewers to follow us in, you know, we, uh, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, because we exist as practical action to make the world work better for everyone, including the youth. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Jacob, for those uh, invaluable inputs. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have any question, but uh, key things that are coming up is access to information for young people, access to innovation and innovative ideas and sharing of experiences, and also getting to know where they can go in terms of asking for support. And uh, it's good to hear that practical action is open to support these uh, young people.
been moving forward. And thanks so much for that. And uh, I'd like now to move on to uh, the next speaker, who will be sharing some of the insights they were able to get from an online survey they did on the effects of the youth on COVID-19 and the agribusinesses, who is uh, Ms. Mazia Pafum uh, from UNFAO. So please feel free and go on. Hi, hi everybody, thanks Alpha. It's a pleasure for me joining this discussion today. Uh, I, I, I'm here in my position as youth engagement specialist. I work for FAO and particularly for a multi-country program uh, that um, aims to boost decent jobs for youth in the agri-food system. So in my role, uh, I usually work to raise the voice uh, and uh, strengthen the agency of rural youth. Uh, so that they can have a, play a, um, a bigger role and participate meaningfully in the agri-food systems, in policy dialogues. Um, and uh, today I, we've heard from many uh, successful agripreneurs, uh, but what uh, we try to do also is to reach out to those that are less skilled and maybe underserved uh, youth. And one of the key strategies that we used to do uh, so is to strengthen uh, partnerships with existing rural youth networks and organizations so that uh, they uh, can build up their capacities to be more inclusive and reach out and provide better services uh, also to those underserved youth. So with outbreak of COVID-19 in March, we launched uh, an initiative very similar to the consultation uh, that uh, Catherine uh, mentioned at the beginning of this uh, webinar, uh, to reach out and hear from the rural youth uh, through these networks and groups of uh, young farmers, champions, agribuners that collaborate with FAO across countries. Uh, to mention a few partner organizations, especially in East Africa, um, we um, mobilized for instance, the um, uh, RIAF Youth in Agribusiness, uh, sorry, RIAF, which is the Rwanda uh, Youth in Agribusiness Forum, or the Uganda Young Farmer Champions Network, uh, youth associated with the Eastern African Farmer Federation, and so on. So thanks to them, uh, we were able to uh, beyond, uh, let's say, the online surveys, uh, we were able also to reduce access barriers because we could also reach out through WhatsApp, uh, email, phones, and, and we were able to receive inputs in many formats uh, that uh, respondents were feeling more comfortable with. So we actually <coughs> heard from over 200 youth from, diff from 24 different African countries through a structured online survey, but we also received many direct testimonies, video messages and stories that we have been also capturing on the FAO website. Uh, this information helped us understand very quickly what was the situation on the ground, the impact of the outbreak in the lives and businesses of these uh, youth. And we also wanted to determine together with them what was more uh, you know, key and feasible to act upon um, in that you know, in the very short uh, term. Um, so what these youth shared with us were the challenges they were facing, interesting, uh, interestingly, across um, very different kind of organizations. We heard from small individual businesses, we heard from cooperatives, social enterprises uh, that operated along different um, agri-food value chains. We also heard the perspectives of companies that produce maybe seeds, biogas, fertilizers, or those that provide agribusiness uh, consultancy or marketing services. And so consistently across all of this variety of activities, uh, uh, they reported as major effects of COVID-19, what we also heard today, uh, you know, majorly loss of income, uh, layoff of casual workers, so loss of uh, employment opportunities, um, reduced markets and post-harvest uh, harvest, uh, losses, um, higher business costs uh, due to higher cost of transportation, inputs, uh, services. And so as a result of these higher running costs and the lower revenues, uh, many uh, found themselves in financial constraints, not struggling with payments of loans, bills, and rents. Um, so uh, many were telling us that they found themselves in a business dilemma, no? and, they, and they didn't know how to go ahead, so resorted to reducing the scale of production and the operational costs. Uh, so maybe hiring less farm workers or asking family members to support, taking over the transportation delivery of products. 
uh, one interesting experience that we heard from um, the Yof Chan, this uh, network of young farmer champs in, in Uganda, is that they were able to negotiate with Boda Boda cyclists a fixed price so that their members can, could afford to transport produce to the trading centers. Uh, but we have to say a fair share of uh, agripreneurs that uh, responded uh, showed that they were reacting very fast to adapt their business models and also trying to challenge themselves and uh, think out of the box, uh, find new opportunities. And so uh, the main coping strategies uh, that we heard of are of course uh, what has been mentioned, you know, alternative marketing strategies and there's been an accelerated move to online marketing and sales. No? So everybody's setting, settling orders on social media, uh, arranging for home delivery and maybe mobile payments. Uh, a second uh, strategy that uh, it's worth uh, highlighting is that many have started adding, adding value to their primary products. Now um, finding themselves with a surplus of fresh fresh products, uh, they started exploring how to process, how to add value, for instance, beekeepers that started to make bee walks or uh, further other byproducts, no? Uh, but perhaps uh, for this discussion today, what is most relevant is that many started to use um, locally sourced agricultural inputs to replace th those that were previously imported and now were unavailable or maybe too expensive, no? Um, so we're talking about seeds, fertilizers, um, uh, also alternative animal feed. Uh, so many switched to, to own production of animal feed, no? or maybe using vegetation instead of cereal. Um, um, another interesting experience uh, was like using bamboo in instead of iron poles for the construction of banana chambers. We heard examples of uh, uh, replacing agrochemicals with organic fertilizers and pesticides uh, produced uh, at home. I think these kind of green solutions uh, that are emerging as part of the response are maybe one of the most interesting examples that need to be watched out and maybe accompanied in the post-COVID-19 phase for long-term sustainability. Um, also another interesting uh, case, for instance, from Uganda in an agri-youth uh, agri incubator is that they were starting to produce masks from banana fiber, no? So, um, I think uh, in terms of uh, FAO, what we have been doing uh, at the global level, we, we have uh, used this information, as I was saying, to advocate for youth inclusive responses uh, with development partners and uh, at country level with the government. So we have been providing policy advice for the next steps, no? particularly in the short term, to ensure that the needs of the young agricultural workers and entrepreneurs are taken into account, even in you know, uh, social protection measures, uh, financial stimulus package, making sure that uh, vulnerable youth groups uh, are uh, targeted. Um, but in the medium and long term, as FAO, of course, uh, we uh, look forward to, um, you know, transitioning to a more uh, to more and better employment opportunities and business opportunities for the youth so what we visualize in this sense is investing more on skills development uh, and also innovative and maybe remote service delivery options um, what I, I wanted to share with you is maybe some very concrete actions uh, that uh, we are trying to support at country level in the countries where we are working um, as I was saying, we are committed to strengthen the partnerships with uh, rural youth organizations so that they can play a role uh, also in the COVID-19 responses. So, for instance, in uh, Rwanda, uh, in consultation with uh, RIAF, which is, uh, you know, the, the national uh, forum, we decided to support them in upgrading their digital communication channels and also improving their membership engagement so that they could be more inclusive in, and support every kind of, uh, you know, awareness but also um, online marketing opportunities as a response to COVID. Uh, in Uganda, for instance, uh, we, uh, there's a technical working group that is supporting a national policy dialogue so that youth can discuss their challenges directly with government and other stakeholders at the national level. And in support to uh, occupational health and safety, uh, a two million mask campaign is being launched. Uh, to ensure that the youth entrepreneurs and farmers comply with the protective measures uh, and standards 
Um, and here the idea is also to support that the provision of these masks come, come from uh, youth producers, no? young producers. Um, also in Uganda, uh, we are supporting the Ministry of Agriculture and Labour to develop standard operating procedures directed to farmers and other um, actors in the agricultural value chain uh, specific to COVID-19. Uh, in other cases, like in Senegal, we are supporting um, uh, networks of young entrepreneurs in their business continuity planning, uh, providing um, also online uh, info sharing and training sessions so that they can uh, hear from experts. Um, I think one point okay. that I heard. Yeah, go ahead, Mazia. One more minute, please. <laughs> Okay. No, I was I was saying that one point that I heard uh, today coming up very often is the term uh, is the point of uh, you know the access to ICTs uh, which has uh, become vital now and how this digital divide that is still there can be reduced and um, in this sense you know in the very short term uh, uh, we have been also trying to support with with these uh, networks and groups of youth. Um, their access by you know, maybe providing internet bundles. But what is most important is that it's not provided to individuals, but to those uh, local youth organizations that are our partners, because they can play a role as intermediaries, no? or infomediaries if you want, so that they can help other, other youth overcome this uh, access barriers of uh, connectivity and maybe digital literacy. And so they can be the ones who facilitate access to remote service delivery. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mazia from uh, UNFAO. Very interesting interventions already happening from your end. Uh, very concrete kind of steps that you have been able to take and based on the information that you are able to uh, take up. Uh, so thanks for that. Uh, maybe uh, going back to Linda, we can maybe have maybe two or three questions before we, uh, before, yeah, because time is really running out. So maybe two, um, yeah, two or three questions, Linda, that are pressing. Yes, okay, so I can start with a question to Marsha. Um, there are people asking or saying that one of the major challenges is that there is a lack of knowledge online and especially when it comes to urban farming. Uh, but in general, uh, how, can, how can we make sure that the uh, information is available online for the targeted youth? Okay, uh, Mazia. A minute. Okay. Hello. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, we've been um, looking at this. For instance, we realized that, that there are actually uh, some COVID relief packages available at country level, maybe coming from financial institutions or even from mobile phone companies but there's no real awareness about that. So what we are trying to do is to work with our national uh, coordinators and partners to collect this information, this information and at least make it available instead of having it dispersed into one specific place. And this is uh, like a key role that uh, you know, platforms dedicated to youth can have. And again, to make this really uh, reach out to the grassroots, then we will need to really work uh, outside of the digital platforms. I mean, we cannot, we cannot think that we will be universal and inclusive if we only work online. No? So that's, uh, that goes back to my point of information intermediaries that are important. Okay, thanks so much, Marzia. Uh, Linda, Thank you. any more? Great, thank you, Marzia. Yes, I have a question for Jacob. Um, so we we need to conserve the environment as well as we do uh, as we do farming. So how can we get youth to get into sustainable or agroecological farming other than that money focused or short term that is sometimes unsustainable farming enterprises and farming practices? How can we get youth into sustainable farming? Thanks so much, Linda. Uh, a minute, Jacob, please. Thank you. Thank you. The, the first thing that we need to realize is that the, the youth work from a background that is resource constrained. And, and, and uh, this is where you know, low cost 
you know, um, approaches, you know, technologies and skills are, are, are important. Uh, one, one of the approaches to agriculture that as part of action we are promoting among the youth is agroecology. So if we are going to, let's say, conserve our soils, then we can use conservation technology. If we are going to fertilize our farms, we can be able to, 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 to do natural fertilization using you know, intercropping technologies that support each other. These are low-cost technologies that are, can be a little interesting and, and to be able to support you know, the youth to work around sustainable agriculture without actually devastating our environments, ensuring that uh, you know, inputs are used optimally and that uh, the planet is, is safeguarded. We need this natural capital for future generations. So that is one approach. The next approach is to uh, get technology to work. We have been able to look at technologies that actually you know, um, enable youth in agribusiness to limit resource you know, um, deployment and, and, and almost get them to practice you know, precision agriculture so that if it is water, the technology monitors water use, it is fertilizer application, uh, uh, which, 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 which arguably would uh, be you know, uh, getting to fertilize their, their farms. It is done to precision so that uh, we safeguard the resources, at the same time safeguard the planet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacob. Very interesting on innovations and uh, how to support young people. And even from us as two scale, we continue to believe that indeed young people are very critical in the agricultural sector, but we need to also take cognizance of the fact that they are resource constrained and how do we support them to be able to use what is already existing and what they already have, which are some of these things such as innovation, such as being a tech savvy, and how do we support them and how do we actually uh, enlighten them and take that to scale actually. So yeah, really uh, very interesting uh, sentiments there. Thanks, thanks so much, Jacob. Uh, Linda, maybe one more? Yes, on sort of the same line there. Um, yeah. I'd like to direct the question to Anthony. Uh, one question that has received many votes. Um, so young people are really doing a lot. They are very, they have very innovative concepts and, but yeah. most of them lack connections and the cost of engaging in productive activities like farming is really how, high. So how can networks and organizations come in handy to support youth in these aspects? Anthony, a minute, please. Okay, uh, doesn't seem to be, to be forthcoming. So maybe uh, someone mm -hmm. else wants to chip in? Anthony, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Okay, good. Did you hear the question? Yes, yes, I did. Okay, so please go ahead for a minute. Yeah. Yes, what I can say is the simplest thing we can do is to create awareness. You see, a good example is we usually have so many conferences. These conferences happen in urban areas. Why can't we have these conferences also happen in rural areas? You see, that way we'll have so many people in the rural areas who might come to the conference and maybe they can hear something good or something that they can maybe uh, follow up. Because I think that's, that's, that would be the easiest way for someone to create awareness. Because once again, so many of these innovations, some of them happen also in rural areas. So you see, someone has made something, but he lacks or uh, he lacks a way whereby he can maybe um, uh, sell his product to other people to, to hear it. So these uh, organizations, I can say like FAO and other organizations who have funding, I think it will be better if you focus on the rural part so that these people who have these technologies can maybe also be seen and be heard. Thanks so much, Anthony. And I think one key thing that also... Can I add just a second on what Anthony has talked about? Please, Jacob, a second, yes. Yes, yeah, so um, the issue here is networks. And uh, I think it's important that we, we, we support the, the sector to work in an ecosystem that is inclusive of the youth. And uh, for a long time, you know, practical action has run 
process of inclusive market systems called participatory market systems development. And this is a fantastic approach that brings in all the, all the players in the sector, including the youth, so that they can be able to facilitate an environment which, which guarantees a win-win situation. We, 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 I think one thing that we must appreciate is that the, 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 the activities that uh, the, the youth will be glad to run away with in, in agribusiness, on-farm and off-farm, some that some, some other players can run away with. And, and what we have seen of, uh, you know, in, in our experience and our practice is that when we facilitate an environment where uh, people see opportunities for a win-win situation, which is not really a cutthroat you know, competition environment, then the youth uh, happens to get an advantage. And this also ex ex extends to, to women. And uh, we, we need to be in a position to facilitate such efforts so that everybody gets a, a, a role to play in a meaningful, beneficial, and productive manner. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jacob. Uh, one more thing I'd like to add from uh, working for a program that is looking at uh, scaling innovations and scaling uh, participation of young people. What we have also been able to do is to try and look at what are the, uh, some of the innovations that exist with the young people, because also it's, it's going to be a bit not okay for us to assume that young people do not have the knowledge. They do actually have a lot of knowledge, but most of the times that we do not capitalize on actually scaling that up and sharing that to more people. So what we do also is that we, in areas that we operate in, in countries that we work in, we also try and create that cross-learning exchange. And that is probably something also that uh, Ruhakana is doing also in Uganda on how do you bring young people to another young person enterprise, to be able to learn and to be able to uh, kind of cross-learning experience. So that will also be an opportunity to be able to bring more young people into that cultural sector. Uh, I see the time is really running from our end. Uh, Linda, is there anything pressing per se? with lots of votes. Yes, I would like to ask one last okay. question to uh, Ian. And uh, that is, how has gender been mainstreamed along the value chains? Because usually the marketing is male dominated. How do the female youth fit into this picture? Okay, thanks so much. Very critical question. Ian, a minute, please. So thank you, Alpha. Thank you, Marcia, for the question. I hope I'm uh, audible this time. Yes. Okay. So to answer the question to do with the, the gender streamlining, uh, perhaps I could only possibly comment on that question with reference to the projects we are doing and the you know, poultry value chain specifically. Now, you yes. find that uh, 80 to 90 percent of uh, people who are engaged in poultry farming are actually women and youth. It's rarely ever men. And uh, the reason for that is a cultural aspect. You find that uh, men would prefer to say they have cows and goats and huge trucks of farms rather than say they have chicken. So chicken has traditionally in Africa been uh, known to be an activity for women. So that being the case, you find that most of our projects, eh, even under two scale, eh, there's a huge focus on uh, women and youth purely because they're the ones who are actually providing the labor and who are actually actively engaged. So even in our trainings uh, at the grassroots, even in our um, uh, interactions, we really focus on um, building the capacity of the uh, women who are engaged in uh, poultry farming together with the youth. You'll also find that most of our training program, especially at the grassroots, eh, are actually very, even in terms of the illustrations, eh, you find a lot of times that the illustration actually just represents women and youth. If you go through most of our training manuals, you find that our focus is always on the women because uh, we feel that uh, once you empower women, eh, you're able to empower the entire family and the entire family is actually able to increase its, uh, uh, its income and the, the quality of their livelihood. I hope I've answered that. Thanks so much. Yes, thanks so much, Ian. And yes, gender mainstreaming and gender inclusion is uh, uh, most of the times is value chain specific and most of the times is uh, context specific. And yeah, there are many opportunities and many resources where we can actually see how this is being done from the UN for our website, from CIANI's website, from other partners engaged in this webinar. We can actually capture a lot of uh, material on the online. Uh, our platforms. So please feel free after this to also interact with some of us and also to go to the, go to the website and also get some of this information. Uh, we should be there. Uh, Linda, do we have any more no. pressing? 
that no? that was all from the questions i uh, would like to say thank you to every each and every one of the attendees for voting and uh, putting so many good questions into the q a so thank you for that yeah thanks so much uh, at this point in time we are actually uh we're actually coming to an end of, of the webinar so it's, it's it's going to be very much uh because the time is really pressing for us so what we can do is that we can actually we want to actually say a lot of thanks in terms of anyone who participated in this webinar. Uh, we had a lot of interest from very many people, from very many partners. And, and yeah, just like any other day, not everyone is able to, uh, to make it to the, uh, to the webinar in terms of various logistical issues. But we really do appreciate your time and we really do appreciate that you are able to actually join uh, for this one and a half hour session. But above all, we are very much grateful in terms of the panelists and the speakers who took their time to share their experiences and to share what they've been going through and some of the things that we actually are seeing in terms of the support they need and what they've been able to get so far. So moving on uh, forward, some of you might be asking, okay, so what next? What, uh, what do you expect after this? And as partners, we see a few options on the table. And one is we're trying to look, at, to look out for new opportunities to apply for new funding to be able to support young people as partners. So that will be on the mainstream in terms of working together to see what are the opportunities outside there. To be able to come in and support young people in the agribusiness sector and continue to increase their engagement even after post, even post COVID, which will be very, very much critical. And then number two is also, uh, we will be able to uh, put together all this information that we've been able to capture in terms of information that comes from uh, the online discussion platform, but also information that comes from this webinar. We'll be able to capture everything together and put it together in a document, uh, one or two documents that we'll be able to share with everyone, even those who are not able to participate, we'll be able to share with everyone and say, there are some of the things that actually came out and we hope and we anticipate that actually this is some of the information that can be used to even lobby for new policies or new engagement in our business. Also to be able to inform some new uh, projects and new initiatives that will come up from different partners, which will support young people. But above all, we hope that we can actually keep in touch with everyone. We'll be able to share uh, through sharing the information, be able to keep in touch, but also be able to see how do we support best uh, all those that were present, but also even those who are not present. And if at all in uh, those who participated, uh, there are any development partners who see opportunities for collaboration, definitely we'll be able to share uh, please uh, feel free to get in touch with us. We will be able to share also in the documents that we're going to, to circulate, the contacts of these panelists who are able to speak in case, uh, because I've seen in case uh, someone is interested to work with someone, then you can actually just reach out to them uh, and be able to engage them and be able to work together. This will be able to uh, see how to uh, catalyze some of these collaborations such as the one between Ian from Home Range Poultry and uh, Mayombe Hatcheries and Nabis, so we'll be able to see how do we support such kind of engagement, such kind of uh, across learning experiences. So once again, uh, thanks so much to all the partners uh, who put this together, uh, Siani, CCAFs, uh, Two Scale, Practical Action, Agrico Focus, uh, CSAYN, yes, and UNFAO, and anyone else who participated even uh, behind the scenes our marketing and communications people who are able to share this as wide as possible, our logistical and uh, support system today, Matthew and Linda, and anyone else who was involved in all these uh, preparations. We want to thank you so much and we want to say uh, a lot of appreciations from us uh, as a team that put this together. So without further ado, if there's nothing from Matthew and from Linda or from Catherine, is there anything from Linda, Matthew or Catherine? No, we're good. Thank you. Oh, yes. Thanks so much. We're good. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much, everyone who participated. Thanks so much. Uh, uh, also, just to say thank you to all the participants um, for all the questions. And I've seen some very interesting collaborations already coming in through the chat. So we are going to put this together as Alpha said. We'll do a blog, we'll do an info note, and we'll try to see how we can engage with policymakers to see how we can build resilience um, moving forward. So thank you very much. And thank you, Alpha, for the wonderful moderation. Thanks so much, everyone. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, call this to an end and say 
uh, see you soon and let the movement grow bigger and let the struggle and the partnership even grow wider and uh, a little continue. I thanks so much, everyone, and see you uh, in other circles as well. Thanks.